Hi, this is Eli Oakletree of the Snow King Beekeepers Association. It's the first of seven sessions to cover the material for apprentice certification by the Washington State Beekeeping Association. Um, and today is April 13th, 2023. So let's get started. This is the patch you are going to get with your certificate. We are the Snow King Beekeepers Association. A lot of what I'm putting on the screen is on your, your chapter outline handout so that you aren't gonna have to go write like crazy and then go through this again on, on the recording to get this, this information. It should all be on your handout. My basic bio, you should always know when you're listening to somebody's ideas about beekeeping, it's important to know where are they coming from? Have they ever kept bees in Washington state before, especially Western Washington? And for those of you on the other side of the mountains, and there's always someone, um, we talk a lot about rain. And sometimes what we're saying will not make any sense because we are talking about a different type of weather pattern than you're seeing. My, mm -hmm. at my place, it froze two nights ago. I assume that's not happening in most of the, of even Western Washington, but the temperatures have been cool. We are in a cool, damp spring. And I think the Canadians are sending all their cold air down here. That's all I can figure. Um, this is my area. This is where I grew up. Um, I, I grew up on a small weekender farm. So I've always been on property, except when I had to move into the city when I got married. Um, I live on an acre out at, near Maltby right now. I have a science background and sometimes I get a little nerdy and it's okay to stop me if I get kind of nerdy, but sometimes all this kind of comes together. It's like when you suddenly understand what that, that chapter in algebra or high school biology or something was about, and you go, wow, there was a reason we learned that. Okay, that's my, I like that part about teaching bees. Tanaino is where I grew up. Uh, you'll see the sign as you go south from, from here, from Seattle. If you go Seattle area, you go south, you'll see a sign that says Tanaino Aberdeen. That's the area I grew up in. And I did bench research, not medical, clinical research. I did hands-on, on the bench, you pour in the test tubes and you pipe it and all that. And I am a master beekeeper. And after being a beekeeper for a while, I found out it was really hard to get good information on anything. So I started looking for the resources, started trying to figure out how to make it available to other people and how to get their information, get theirs available to me. And I learned a lot from teaching classes, from the Facebook discussion group that our club has and other clubs from the YouTube channels, especially when it's the local club YouTube channels, which is, is worth checking out. Puget Sound Beekeepers, it, there's quite a number that have a YouTube channel. We're not the only ones. Finding the opportunities to network and to communicate and share, that's the hard part for beekeepers in a small area. You can go out on the internet and you get somebody's ideas, but it's hard to really get any feedback and interact. Mentoring and hive side chats are really important. And the hive sides are what we've succeeded the most at. Mentoring is still difficult to set people up. But if you want to meet other beekeepers a few at a time, like this Saturday, about six are coming already to this Saturday's hive side. And they'll have a chance to at least meet another beekeeper. And every once in a while, they find out that they are close together. And you go ahead and use the chat if you want to introduce yourself and say what area you're in. Some of you just finished the beginner class with Gina Cuff. She's pretty good, isn't mm -hmm. she? That was mm -hmm. really neat. I, I'm so glad she did that. And she and you all helped her get uh, more credits for her journeyman final certification. She's well on the road now, but uh, but that'll help her finish up. And you helping everybody get through the beginner, apprentice, journeyman, and master. Master's not that undoable now. They're changing the program. And you might be thinking, oh, I'm not that interested. But you might find you are. You might find, like a lot of people do, 
that by the time they finish two or three years of beekeeping, they're helping other people out. They're offering to do their information. They're helping at their club fair booth. They're, you just find out you're already doing things. You're giving the presentation on pollinators at your garden club or your preschool. Got cute little songs for people who, uh, who might be teaching preschoolers. I, I have to do that at some point. Do our head and shoulders, knees and toes song. Except it's head, thorax, abs, and wings. Um, we are a member bee club, a member of the bigger state association. It's a very loose relationship. They let us use their curriculum, but it is it benefits both of us. We donate some money to them, and they maintain the curriculum system and issue the certificate that you actually get at the end of every tier. Um, Oh, we do have a monthly meeting next Wednesday. If you get a, a Zoom link for that, you're automatically on the newsletter unless you subscribe out of it. And you better tell me, otherwise you'll automatically get put back on if you do subscribe out. Almost nobody subscribes out because there's so little that is geared for beekeepers that is not trying to sell you something. I think our newsletter is a welcome relief. The Facebook discussion page, if you have trouble finding that, I will help you. If you're in Western Washington, if you're in Eastern Washington, the only problem is we talk Western Washington and it doesn't make sense sometimes. And we're interested in different places to get our nukes and our supplies and all those sorts of things. I'm recording, you're getting recorded right now. And the class recordings are unlisted. If you go to our YouTube channel, if you type in Smoking Beekeepers Association, the whole thing, onto YouTube, you will get our channel. Or here's the link here. But you won't see the class recordings. They're pretty informal. It's not professional quality. And they're really for you. So they will, I will send, and, and Gina did the same thing. Except she actually sent it to me. And that's why it took so long sometimes. Because I was the person who was supposed to get it onto YouTube. But sometimes that's really handy. You know something was said and you go back to your manual and you say, okay, it has to be in this session. And then you can find it. There is a test. Those of you who already took the beginner, you know that the test is based on the manual. Even if I think I have a great idea, it's not my opinion or suggestion. Yeah, online test is based on the manual. And we generally follow that manual's table of contents. It's... Uh, not quite in the same order as it was for beginner. So do look at it. I sent out the syllabus on the, in that first class email. And I try to put my supplemental material on those handouts, the chapter outline and extras that I send with you. And if I don't tell you why I'm sending you an extra, feel free to ask me. Sometimes it's obvious, it's just useful information to know how much equipment costs her. And some of you took beginner, so Gina already sent some of our handouts out. There are two Facebook pages. That one confuses people. The one in the lower right is the public one. The one the upper left is the, the private group, which is now not 200 people. It's like 600 and some or something right now. Um, not everybody's super active, but it's a great place to ask a question. And later on in the season, when you're looking for a queen and somebody knows who has queens that's within driving distance of you, don't forget to give your closest town or something. You don't have to be super uh, revealing about where you live or what exactly what you do. But if you're asking for some information, like, where can I buy a queen? Does anybody know where I can get an emergency? I didn't know I needed another feeder or whatever. Okay, then that's good. Check in there but give them a general idea whoever you're at asking the whole facebook discussion group let them know where you're looking because even western washington is big and if you're eastern washington definitely uh this is the what you see publicly yeah for example our monthly meetings some of which are you know winterization if you need something on winterization it can actually be good to go to our YouTube channel and check out the latest, the last couple of years. Syllabus. This is on your, your chapter handout. We pretty much go in order. I always change something. And this, yeah, this manual is toward the end. There are a couple of chapters that just kind of go together. 
foraged native pollinators, helping pollinators, yeah, at the end. And then if we have time, we can do some test review. But the test is based on the manual, so a lot of people don't have any problem. At the beginning of this manual, to some extent, it recaps the first couple chapters of the beginner manual. And if you need an updated beginner because you didn't take beginner with Snow King or you took it a long time ago, just ask me. I can send you the digital manual and you can always get the 2023 digital manual. Your apprentice manual is the 2023. But in that preface to the apprentice manual, it quickly runs through and you'll recognize this local ordinances, dealing with your neighbors, ordering the bees, basically, it just kind of goes quickly through. So it's expecting you in the apprentice manual and in the apprentice course to remember a lot of that. If there's anything you want to talk more about, that's fine. And uh, citing an apiary, for example, is something you put it in one place, then you change your mind. Okay. Or you think I need a better place for the winter that comes up. Uh, the equipment. Everybody always has equipment questions. Do I need this? Would it be better if I did this? Package versus nuke, you probably already resolved. But any of this you'd like to cover in questions and answers, feel free to. So all that was in the preface, covered in beginner. Um, and we have questions and answers after every time that I finish talking for a while. And if you need anything that was beginner, don't, don't hesitate to ask. I assume you have it. Some of the beginner handouts you will find under files on the Facebook group and or I'm starting to put them under resources on the website. I know a lot of people are not crazy about Facebook. It's you get on there and you waste your time, it, it, you know, with clickbait or whatever. So I usually kind of rock it through 90 minutes. This is a pretty small class, so it's easier for you to flag me down if I'm not making sense. But usually I figure, well, this is being recorded for people that can't be here or can't finish, can't stay. And I try to get done by eight. I really do try to make sure that we're out of here by eight. Got with the outlines, I think that helps speed things up if you don't have to write a lot. The digital manual, some people work better with that. You don't have to have a print manual, but I went ahead. I think this time I sent it out with everyone. But from now on, we'll kind of do a save a tree if people want don't want the print manual. You're always welcome to return it too. Somebody else can always use it if you really don't use print manuals. And then I think I sent out, and you already saw these three items down here under resources, I think, if you took beginner. If not, I believe I resent the equipment list with prices because people go into sticker shock if they've been out of beekeeping for a while. And even the prices that are on there are now getting to be a couple of years old and prices are going up. So part of an, an apprentice is figuring out how you're going to take care of your equipment and maximize its usage so that it lasts longer. That is actually something that's important is the correct use of your hive tool and such. And hopefully you, you know what kind of questions you ask your new package suppliers now. And same for getting queens. Don't assume anything. Uh, if you don't ask, you know, you, you sometimes assume that it's a local queen when it was shipped in from Kona, Hawaii. The Kona queens are famous, maybe not bad. Maybe they use the same bees with the same genetics that we need in this area. Maybe not. The stress of shipping is actually a problem. And we have a great 2023 nuke and package supplier list, which is definitely on the website. And I try to send it out each time. It's nine pages. So don't just stop at page one. It's an alphabetical order. We don't recommend, but there's quite possibly somebody closer to you than you ever suspected. A lot of apiary supplies. Um, however, when you're going to apiary supplies, I would not suggest assuming that the cashier is a reliable beekeeper source. 
they can be good hearted, but please don't assume that they are, you know, and it's kind of hard to ask, well, how many years you've been keeping bees? But it, it's kind of a good question followed by, oh, and how are you doing at the overwintering? How's that going? It, if you can find a good way to ask that. I do a lot of mail order myself and get the free shipping, especially as you know what you need. Now on the hive sides, we're having the first one at the Maltby location, which is actually my house, this Saturday, 11 to 1. Let me know if you want to come. We're up to half dozen people, but that's manageable, especially since we're going, we won't be able to go inside of hives. It is too cold. I don't really even hope we're going to get to 60 dry and, and windless. I, I really doubt it. But we're going to, going to do oxalic acid vaporization with wand and with gun go through spring management, talk about feeders, which is very, very big to get your hives that boost if you're in a cool, uh, damp area like we are. And even then, just to get that boost, to get that population up before your big nectar flow. And if you can get the population up before then, your bees can take advantage of it, of that big nectar flow when it comes. Otherwise, they don't have enough foragers to really take advantage of it. Granite Falls is starting May 7th, maybe a little sooner. Oh. If you want to be on the to notify list, email me and say that. And Sultan, we have a Sultan location that we haven't really started yet. So I, I need to talk to people about that in the next week or two. Let us know if you're interested and we will work harder at getting it open if we know somebody's gonna come. Sultan being a little bit out on that highway to towards Stephen Pass. The cream rearing workshop has been delayed. I thought we would already be at least doing the basic class beforehand. More information on that next week at the meeting. Now, before I really start on chapter one, thanks for listening to all the announcements. But before I really start, it's always important to admit that beekeeping is experiential. Experiential really is anecdotal. And Beekeeping attracts independent thinkers, which is a polite way of saying opinionated. It is, it is well known that if you have 10 beekeepers in a room, you're lucky if you only have 10 opinions. I'm one of those people that can start talking one way and then flip the other way and say, oh, but you also, there's another, there's another way to do this. It is very location specific. And really one of the most important things you do when you're discussing online, and I know everybody eventually, even if you weren't going to, get into it online, you will end up posting something or answering a post, mentioning where you're from, where your bees are is really, really important. And that can be in terms of elevation, how close you are to a river, are you near cropland, something that tells people why you're saying what you're saying. And, because, and I hate to say that beekeeping is only occasionally based on research. If you can find it, Sometimes it's out there, it's just hard to find. And I hope no one's too disappointed. You've all learned about Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. If I tell you that not everything on the internet is true. And I like to throw this, okay, this slide's just totally out of order, but I like to throw it in because Washington is now in the top 10 honey producing states. See up in that right hand corner, those little bars? Okay, the bottom one is Washington, snuck in there. And that sounds kind of unbelievable, but it has to do, this is, a, and I've, I've got actually the wrong solstice over here. It's the winter solstice. We, we get really short days, but because of that stuff you learned in grade school about the tilt of the earth, we not only get the short days in the winter, we get the longest days in the summer. And that is part of it. If you look at those top 10 states, and you probably can't read the fine print, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, skip, skip, and then go to Minnesota, Montana, Michigan, and Washington. Okay, we're talking, that's over half, or right as far north as you can go in the contiguous 48 states. And it's not an accident. It's because with a little bit of calculation about when to feed your bees, when to make or not make splits, when to requeen, there are ways to strategize and get your honey production up. 
this class isn't about that really, but I just want you to know it is possible, even in the soggy western part of the state. Okay, actually officially starting chapter one. It seems like it's a lot of dry stuff. And to me, it's not at all dry. Because when you keep bees for a while, you start understanding that you have to go through some of this stuff. And some of it's like, okay, we did this in biology. You just memorized all this stuff. I learned uh, Kings play chess on flat green sand. And I can't remember the other one that more people learned. But that there's a, there are kingdoms. And I think the next slide would probably be better. Here we go, classification. That there's a kingdoms. Animal, plant, fungus, and there's two bacteria. One's the last I heard of. That's the last system I learned. And throughout my life, they keep changing how they do it. Then each kingdom is divided into phyla. Phyla? Probably phyla. And it's important that bees are animal, that they are arthropods. They have an exoskeleton and they have jointed legs. Okay. And that their class insecta, which I learned, I think, is hexapoda which now is class insecta. And I believe that's one of the questions that I missed when I first took the test because I'd never heard of class insecta. I learned hexapoda. So I believe that is one of the answers. Insecta, why is, all the, why is it important just up to here? Bees are actually used a lot in medical research because they are sufficiently, they are animal. So some of their cells are similar to us. Insect cells are actually used to grow viruses and such. In the lab I worked in, we would grow certain types of proteins and such. You grow them better in an animal cell that you are culturing in a lab than trying to grow them in bacteria. I guess I'm getting off topic here. Okay, but what's important about this already is if something kills animals in general, it's going to kill bees. If it kills arthropods, Good chance it's going to kill bees. If it's an insecticide, it kills bees. I have a neighbor I can't convince of this. If he goes to the hardware store and buys something to kill fruit flies, the idea that it kills other flying uh, animals, and actually, no, flies are, are, are diptera, they're not hymenoptera. So hymenoptera, yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're, I think diptera is... Completely different order. But anyway, the idea that they're class insecta and therefore an insecticide tends to kill. Very seldom is something targeted to not kill the whole big larger group. It's just more lethal in the way it's applied or in concentration or whatever. So I can't convince, for example, my neighbor that any insecticide is going to kill bees. Now it's important when you are looking at the rest of this, this actually is of value. For example, you go down to Hymenoptera, membranes, rings, full complete metamorphosis, egg to larva to pupa to adult stage. Important because of a, a lot of how chemicals affect a complete metamorphosis insect. Bent antennae, that actually helps you tell something from B and not B. If it doesn't have bent antenna, it isn't going to be a B. Oh, and also, but then when you get down farther, family the apidi, apidi, having two pairs of wings, relatively long tongue, hair on body, as compared to wasps and hornets. And already as beekeepers, I, I hope you're starting to feel like, wow. I know what a bee is, and I know what a wasp and hornet is, and I'm no longer in that group of they're all bees. And you're beginning to tell the bumblebees is such a part. Honeybees are a part of that. They're unlike bumblebees and solitary bees and carpenter bees and mining bees and alfalfa bees and all those other bees, they store honey. Now there are other species of bees that store honey. Only Apis mellifera has managed to leave the the continent of Asia and move elsewhere. Actually inhabit all the continents, except I don't know about Antarctica, but pretty far north in the Arctic. And they build homes of wax. 
This includes the Asian honeybee and the giant honeybee. Asian honeybee is serrana, giant honeybee is dorsata. Why is that important? That's how things like Varroa jumped from the species Mellifera from serrana to Mellifera. That's why it was so easy. That's why it's important. And coming up, there's another mite that is expected to jump from serrana to Mellifera, tropolalaps. It's coming in. If we ever figure out what to do about Varroa, then we'll probably be taking, we'll be taking care of that next, trying to figure out how to treat for that mite. Mellifera is the only one that escaped the tropics. Then there's what they call subspecies and strains and ecotypes, and your book spends quite a bit of time on them. But first I want to point out how unique the European honeybee is, and it is the European Western Apis mellifera honeybee. In some senses, it's an invasive species. Uh, 1622, I think is the date your book gives, might have gotten here earlier. And it loves to pollinate the other invasive species, European crops that we love, and invasive weeds. It still acts tropical. So as you're reading through this really dry chapter, stop and think. It does things that other insects don't do. Its anatomy is different. And back in Europe, they have very distinct types of those bee strains, subspecies, ecotypes. There's a lot of words. They all mean the same thing. In Europe, they can actually maintain those separately because they have geographical barriers. Like the Mediterranean Sea, the, the Alps, you know, some small barriers like that. In the United States, the Rocky Mountains could have, except we've transported so much so much across the, and around the Rocky Mountains that it didn't work. But that could have been a sufficient barrier here. All the bee breeds in the United States, no matter what people say, soon as you let that queen go out and mate with 10 to 20 drones and she picked, I mean, what, whoever, you have no control over it unless you're on an island, you're isolated geographically, you got mutts. Very efficient mutts, very all the all the better, all the more resilient and healthy and robust, but they're mutts. I put this this history quickly in your outline. You don't need to know it, for example. This isn't on the test, except the fossil one. 14 million old year old fossil. There's something about there was a native honeybee here in North America at one time. I remember that. And that's not too surprising. It's like the horses died out, the camels died out. Then they brought the horses back. We never got the camels back. But there are species that have gone extinct that were here in North America. And honeybees is one of them. I think that probably they came in the 1500s with the Spanish, but I don't have any documentation of that. But definitely through the colonists on the East Coast, and then they spread across the United States, as the Native Americans called them, the white man's fly. They didn't really like them at first. I don't know if they ever really liked them. But bees to get west of the Rockies, the one big barrier we have, were shipped by sailing ship around the tip of South America and back up. So they didn't get here until a good 200 years after the rest of the United States. Bee space is important. We, as beekeepers, we respect it because if we don't work with our bees, we're not going to be successful, and it's going to be very frustrating for us and for the bees. We've had troubles with pests already. Tracheal mites, and their Latin name is Icarapus woodii. In 1922, you will constantly hear this referred to, that we have a genetic bottleneck until recently. In 1922, the borders of the United States were basically closed to adult bees. And then they sort of reopened them mostly by importing artificial semen, artificial semen, semen from drones and artificially inseminating European drone semen into queens here. That's actually how they brought in the Carniolan, the Caucasian, the Russian genetics. Some were brought in by permit, entire adult bees but it, it's very difficult to get such a permit from 
the USDA. But the quarantine worked. It worked for 60 years. And finally, Icarapus woodii got, it, got here, wiped out the hives really badly. But the beekeepers could breed from the survivors because the Western European honeybee had already seen the tracheal mite, particularly in the European area. And that is why the Italian queens, one of the reasons they became so popular to almost the exclusion of everything else for a while. And then three years after, after that happened, the beekeeping industry had pretty well recovered and Varroa destructor hit. And that one we're still working with. And then the African eyes came a little later. It was kind of a bad 10 years there to really be in beekeeping, especially if you were in the South of the United States. And then colony collapse disorder came which we blame on Nosema, and notice the word that's N for Nosema and Serrani, as in Apis Serrana, Asian honeybee. Uh huh. It isn't just the Varroa mite; it's also a form of Nosema, and we're expecting another mite, Triple A lapse, to come. So it is important that there are other honeybee species that it's easier for that cross species transmission to happen. So here's the different colors of, of worker bees that you might see in your hives. And some people say, oh, that's definitely like that amber one. That's definitely Italian. Oh, the really black one. That's, mm, that's Caucasian. That other one, oh, that looks. But the truth is, unless someone is charging you a fortune and has done some back crossing with that artificial insemination, even though you see these different colors of queens, is no guarantee they're going to have the characteristics. But your book has some questions on it on the test. It wants you to know that how that these strains did have these characteristics back where they came from. And they kept them separate back where they came from with those geographical barriers that we don't have except for the Rockies. Now, the car, you may have never, I don't know if you've really ever thought about this, the Carniolans, Carniolan Alps are here. The Caucasian mountains are over here. I think vaguely. My, I'm pretty vague on mine. Mediterranean, though. Italian, okay. The Italian bees from here. You'll hear about the blacker, darker North European bee. I don't know that anybody's directly importing those. The oddity is the Russian bee. You would think, okay, here's Europe way over here. You think that this Russian bee would be from that side of Europe? No, it's from the side closest to like Japan, that side of Russia. That's important because the reason a number of breeders have been fast, fascinated by the Russian bee is it might have some kind of resistance that it had a chance to develop when Varroa made the cross species jump from the eastern honeybee to the western. Just so you know, that was part of the fascination with Russian and still is. If you breed from something that might have some resistance, there's the hope that eventually you're going to get the bee that really can resist the varroa mite. Honeybees are really, really different. That whole tropical thing. Each individual honeybee is cold-blooded. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but no bee by itself can exist outside in temperatures Oh, say they go below like 45, maybe I'll barely manage to huddle in some little corner and get back into the hive the next morning if the sun warms it. But the hive as a whole is warm blooded. The brood have to be maintained at 92 to, to 94 degrees to develop. Even if there's snow on the ground outside or it's sub zero outside, if there's brood in that hive, the worker bees have to keep it have to keep that brood at 92 to 94. Thinking about your own body temperature, 98.6. The hive as a whole has to be warm-blooded. If there's no brood in, in the wintertime, the bees still try to maintain it 68 to 70 to protect the queen. Um, for example, she could lose fertility if the sperm that she has stored in her body goes too low in temperature, and also if it goes too high. 
So they need to regulate the temperature for her as well as for all the bees that are clustered together during the winter to stay warm. A lot of insects are social, ants and termites, but the honeybee is really social, really divides up the characteristics, really cooperates, can't live individually. A queen, once she's developed, is a queen for life. A worker can't become a queen. Even if she can lay an egg, an unfertilized egg, at a, one at a time, the laying worker situation that you might have already heard about, even if she can do that, she never becomes a queen. The workers raise queens when they raise queens, and those are queens for life. The genetics are far more complicated than most of what we ever cover. I don't even, if I get started talking about that, because I love the genetics, it, we'll spend too much time on it. I really have to control myself, but come back for journeyman. And it is really fascinating. And there's this, it's like the wild card in genetics is something called homologous recombination. And it just, after you thought you understood dominant and recessive and haploid and diploid, which we're going to go into, you think you understand all that and how sex, uh, sex uh, gender is determined. Okay, no, no. Homologous recombination screws everything up really good. It's the only insect that's artificially inseminated, which I think is really interesting. It's the only insect that excretes its own building material. Seriously, wax. All the other, if you stop to think about all the other things that you might have called a bee before you became a beekeeper, wasp, hornets, etc. They'll do things like take some saliva and mix it with some wood pulp and make a nest. But they don't, can't excrete wax or do anything like that. And bees are the only insect that makes a food we eat. Not an insect that we eat, but an insect whose food we steal. Well, we like to think of it as as getting a certain amount of return on investment when we're helping manage the bees, but we rob them to be truthful. It is important that you understand that this is very, very different. It's not just social, it's you social, the ultimate social, the truly social, like the highest degree. They don't just live together in a group. They don't just cooperate on brood care, but they overlap generations. It isn't like the wasps and the Hornets all die out. Only mated queens. You see a wasp or a hornet flying around right now. It's a mated queen and she's ready to start that whole hive. And I hope you can catch her if she's near your beehives before she manages to do that. Traps out. They're starting to fly already. And the reproductive division of labor is almost complete. Only that laying worker stratagem, if a Hive has absolutely no queen. With their last gasp, laying workers will allow the hive to make some kind of drones that might mate. I'm not even sure they could do that successfully. But basically, no. It is queen, drone, worker. And only the queens basically lay the eggs. So Apis mellifera didn't just do social. And it didn't just even do you social. It went all the way. It went from a tropical climate. It is the one honeybee that escaped the tropics and can now live in the temperate zone. And even Arctic zone, really, actually. There's a, an important beekeeper who keeps bees up in north of the Arctic Circle. They did this by coming up with a system for storaging for storing a lot of surplus food for the winter. They did it by moving into cavity nesting, which some of the other honeybees do. And then they developed this incredible clustering behavior so that they could share body heat and live through very, very cold extremes. They also did a lot of this by getting super efficient. The comb system that we see and we marvel at every time we go into the hives in, in 3D is this incredibly optimized brood sheet. It has thermal efficiency. It has the brood in the center with 
like a shell of bee bread around it and then uh, honey stores above it that help trap heat and insulate the hive at the top. I mean, why lose all that good heat? And then the bees separate, they did all this by separating out the brood cells from the honey cells, from pollen cells, from just uh, the, cap, the capped honey cells. They, they separated it all out in a very extremely efficient way. And they could do this because they are the super organism of all super organisms. Oh, I, I think I did not send you this, so I should send it to you. Because all this anatomy I, I mentioned and that you know as a beekeeper, give yourself credit. Part of apprentice is giving yourself credit for what you've already seen and what you've already started to realize. People say, call you up, and if you are the swarm line person or just Get one of these calls from someone who knows you keep bees, and they say, oh, I've got a swarm, and and uh, I need you to come get it right away. And then they tell you that the nest is in a tree. Okay, what do you already know about honeybees? That's not very likely. Barely. I think I have a picture in here of some desperate bees that didn't find a place, a cavity. But because they're cavity dwellers, right away you know, uh-uh. If they say they're in a little tiny birdhouse, mm, that's really very unlikely. Bees live in bigger groups than that. And then they, they, they're they leaving and entering, but did they see a bee line? Okay, this is the point at which you, you, you start suspecting you haven't got honeybees. And if they're not close by, you need to know before you go out there with your whole swarm catching gear, you need to know, is it really a honeybee swarm? So ask for the picture. You can ask some questions as, as close as they feel safe getting. Not recommending anybody get closer. Since they're probably talking yellow jackets, bald faced hornets, most swarm calls actually usually aren't honeybees. I, I can tell you from my experience. Ask for the picture as good as they can get. Cell phones are good even at a distance with the zoom and the resolution nowadays. Ask what they look like, ask how many, expect people to have no idea how many there really are. But how many are entering and leaving on a sunny day? And, and then if they don't see that bee line, that's part of tells you it's not a honeybee hive. What are they entering and leaving? A visible nest hanging in the tree? No. In the ground? Barely possible, but almost never. A birdhouse is not large enough. And then you find out that they they haven't been there that long. And you ask, what are they doing? And if they're chewing their way through the ceiling in somebody's room, literally, I've had that kind of call. They just chewed their way through. And that's when I have to explain that, you know, you don't have a honeybee. No one's going to come get it. You're going to have to exterminate it. And in that case, I lent the, the gal a bee suit and said, if you're going to have to go up there, and because she didn't have any money, you know, she, she needed to get up there with that wasp killer and kill the daylights out of those yellow jackets coming down into her daughter's bedroom. Okay. If you feel like getting that involved, fine. But mainly, you need to be able to explain to people that there's an annual cycle of almost all other bees and wasps. So if they wait it out now, the exception is if it's up in their attic and it's insulated year round, I'm not absolutely sure they will totally die out. Because the, their food sources have gone down outside, I would hope they do, but bumblebees in a birdhouse are in a compost pile. You can reassure people. So you've learned a lot by being an apprentice and by learning all this anatomy. And I wanted to point out how unique the, the honeybee is. This, these are the other kinds of bees. Here's the Asian honeybee likes lives in much smaller cavities and uh, makes much less honey. But there's somebody reaching in and getting some, some comb out. And people keep them, usually not formally in, in large stacks of hives, but some, some do keep them actually in various types of containers and, and hive stacks. This is the giant honeybee, Dorsata, and it does single combs. And this one is Floria. 
What's interesting about these is, okay, well, here's, just to show you that they are different. I think this is Floria, and then our, there's our dear honeybee, and there's Dorsata, the giant one. But what's interesting is they build combs. Serana, the Asian one, does build multiple combs. But a lot of the others, like Floria, don't build multiple combs. And they don't organize the brood nest and... I have something out of order here. Ah, I think I have it later. They don't organize, they don't separate honey, brood, pollen, and such. They, they just don't. And that is part of why they can't leave the tropics, but the honeybee could, because it became such an efficiency expert. So you know how to tell people this is not a a honeybee. That's not a honeybee nest you see there. Those aren't honeybees gathering the wood fibers to make that nest. And you can recognize bald-faced hornet hovering over front of honeybee hive. And the other thing that's really interesting, oops, sorry here, about um, the honeybee, the hornets. Remember I said that only the mated females, you may already know this, only mated females in those wasps and hornets in the temperate zone. We are lucky this way. Only they actually successfully overwinter and they go crawl away and find some place to hide. And then they come out. Well, every year somebody thinks they've seen the Northern Giant Hornet, which used to be called the Asian Giant Hornet, because this huge one on the bottom buzzes them when it comes out early in the year. It's just the queen and she really is just twice the size of a worker. That's bald faced hornet worker and queen. So that's why they seem so big. Now, every once in a while, with bad weather, maybe it's raining and pouring and they can't find another home and the swarm will actually get stuck out in the open. Every once in a while it happens. And this gal sent me this beautiful picture. She didn't call for anybody to come and try to capture the bees and hive them. And so by the time it all died, it had gorgeous comb. But... Every once in a while, honeybees get trapped. They can't find a cavity. But that is rare. You know how to tell a yellow jacket. You know, back in that anatomy, thinking about it. Okay, missing the fuzziness. Does have the wasp waist. But look at the way the wings fold differently, longitudinally. And our cute little fuzzy vegan honeybees are not like these vespids that rear their larvae on insect prey, including bees and bee larvae. And they sting repeatedly and it hurts a lot worse. And I, the book makes a point of saying the adults may be beneficial. So we're not worried about the ones that aren't close to our hives. I only trap for ones that are getting too close to my hives. I'm not interested in killing off a beneficial insect that's beneficial in the rest of the environment. This is important. I mentioned that carnivorous thing because you need to have good apiary hygiene when for some reason you have some dead bees out there, clean them up because doggone those yellow jackets, I don't know if it's a fresh, it looks to me like I see them eating the fresh dead bees that are out there for some reason. Uh, anything, maybe you were working on the hive and some were crushed and thrown out. Keep removing all kinds of trash that might attract the hornets and the wasps to your area. Clean up after yourself and after the bees. If they have, if there's like a bunch of dead bees due to a fall freeze or something, get them out of there. Remove that because it's going to attract the wrong kind of visitor, yellow jackets and bald faced hornets. And I am dead set against these front feeders. I know a lot of people like them. Some people say, well, I only put water in them. And that's possible that that won't attract yellow jackets and hornets so much. But I'm still not sure of that. If your bees need water, maybe the wasps and yellow jackets do too. I hate these boardman feeders that are meant to fit into the front entrance. I think, I think they're trouble. I would avoid them. And I need to change to Northern Giant Hornet is the rename. 
and there were no nests in our in our state at all last year are we free two years in a row when you're free like three or something that's when they will stop doing the sentinel project that our club helps distribute the traps if you're interested in that later on in the year here's the the picture i was looking for of how the other asian honeybees never got efficient enough to leave the tropics and live in sub-zero temperatures and such that our bees can do because look at this messed up comb this would be really messed up if it was in a honeybee hive but this is normal they did not organize into the brood is separate from the food and this kind of food and that kind of food they didn't do that they didn't they stayed in the tropics and that's sort of a repeat slide breeds and just i know your book spends a lot of time on it. i, I kind of can't take it too seriously because i always see mutts on the other hand you will have two hives side by side and one of them does one of these behaviors one of them just can't stop doing propolis <laughs> i don't know if you can replace it if that's a reason to replace a queen propolis is good for bees but if you're the beekeeper, you may not appreciate how good it is for the bees when you're busy trying to unstick those hives, especially at the end of the season or in the spring when they've got everything nicely propolis sealed, kept them nice and comfy while they were overwintering. But uh, the Italians, they were the most popular for a long time. They love to brood up. They like it, the big families. They just they love being in colonies of 60,000 or more. And that means more winter stores, more for you to, to harvest as a beekeeper. The Carniolans, they say they overwinter well. Before you spend extra money and decide you really want Carniolans, if you get the Carniolan traits that make them overwinter well, just be prepared for what that actually means. It means that they don't lay up a lot of stores because they don't overwinter as a large cluster. They're happy being smaller. That mean, And in the spring, they take their time. When it's cold and wet and miserable, if you have two hives side by side and one of them decides it's cold out there, why in the world would we brood up this early? We're waiting until it warms up. And so they don't like to, even if you feed them. That's why they overwinter well in the Carniolan Alps. One of the reasons. So uh, Caucasians, again, could do the same. Russians, the Russians are getting easier to obtain, and there is a Russian Honey Bee Breeders Association because they were supported by the USDA, got special permits, and they did actually, with crossing and back crossing and some importation of adults, got fairly pure lines, and you can actually buy pure Russians. Of course, you, bu you, got, you buy that expensive queen and she goes up in the wild blue yonder and she does whatever she pleases with 10 to 20 drones that you did not select. Africanized is important just to know that they, they exist. They are not surviving up here so far is best I'm hearing. And that makes sense because of their strategies. You can get into quite a conversation about how we ended up with the Africanized and why that limits them being able to go into the temperate zones. Saskatraz, there's a lot of interest in Saskatraz recently. It's a hybrid that has to be rebred and it can vary quite a bit in what you get, depending on how meticulous the breeder is who is breeding them down here in the United States for you. And I guess the true Saskatraz is supposed to be as of the, when I made this slide up a couple of years ago, exclusively offered by the Oliveris honeybees using official breeder queens from official, imported from Canada. Okay, I'm sorry, doubles there. So you do see these characteristics. You will have two hives side by side and one decides at once the big family and you go, that's Italian. And then the other one says, ah, it's cold, wet, and miserable this spring. Let's just wait until it gets a little warmer. And then it, when it starts to brood up, it'll do it all at once. 
and you will get that big population increase. And the danger with that is if you see that happen, watch out in the fall because some of those that show that carniol and trait will again show it in late July, August, maybe a little earlier than you want because you want your fat bees, your winter bees, you want the queen to be laying them maybe the beginning of August, maybe later in August if you think you can push it that close to when our weather will change, especially in Western Washington, it'll make that change over. And you want well-fed fat bees. The fat bodies are as developed as possible going into the winter so they can overwinter and live five, even six months. Now, I, I make this comment about mutts, and I, I know people really do want to get try different kinds of bees. And yes, you can. Sometimes what you're getting is a more likely than not, you will get the carniolan traits or Caucasian traits or whatever traits. And sometimes you just don't get it at all. Once you've got your hive with Russian strain or Italian strain or whatever, one problem I have found is that even experienced beekeepers expect that queen, her offspring queens, offspring queens from that hive to mate with drones from that hive. And nature works really hard to make sure that queens do not mate with their sibling drones. They, the mating system in honeybees is extremely complex. The flight distance that the queen flies from the hive before she's ready to mate and the flight distance that the drone flies is different. The altitude at which they fly is different. And there's also a gene that if they're too closely related, it's sometimes called the sex determinant gene and sometimes it's called CSD, complementary sex determinant, I think. And if they are too closely related, the offspring, when the queen goes to fertilize the egg with the sperm that's too closely related to her eggs, the combination of genes results in something called a defective diploid drone, which you should never see in your hives because the workers remove them almost immediately. They don't generally grow them out, but a researcher managed to do it once. And that's how we know what they look like and that they are defective diploid drones. They can't function as a drone or as a worker or as a queen or as anything. So you paid for this expensive breeding queen. And there are people that were paying like 500, even now there are queens that go for a thousand dollars. I think even the Washington State University artificial insemination program sells queens that expensive, a thousand, 1200 or more. But the problem is, is her offspring when you come back to where your apiary is, her offspring queens are going to have half her genetics. And those offspring queens are going to go off in the wild blue yonder and mate with you didn't have any control over 10 or 20 drones. So you quickly lose that in your apiary. It dilutes out those genes you wanted. That's kind of the simple explanation. When it's diluting out those genes, you get new combinations of genes. And there has been more aggressive behavior reported just everywhere. This is anecdotal. I can't prove this. No one really studies it. There is more aggressive behavior noticed by beginners than you used to notice when I started beekeeping nine years ago. At that time, pretty much aggressive hive, you just squash that queen and get rid of her and get a new queen. Um, but that's not what you suggest so much nowadays. Now you make sure that you can't resolve the problem any other way because it's kind of the high F1 hybrid problem. And aggression is a normal, instinctive, wild type trait, I guess I would say. Honeybees need to defend their colonies. How much, how aggressive, how much aggression can you put up with? If you're having a problem, you can ask somebody else in, but you will sometimes get super aggressive bees. And part of it is this new mixing of genes we're doing by bringing in 
Caucasian and Carniolan and Russian. And, and we're just mixing up the genes. And it's like mutts. You can get the most lovable mutt dog ever. And you can get one that got all the bad characteristics. And it's just hopeless. On top of that, there is a thing called homologous recombination. And that's the really fun wild card in genetics in bees. So in your handout, I think I put some breed descriptions, partly because the breed descriptions in your manual are not necessarily what you're going to see when you thought you bought a carniolan queen and you get her offspring or, or a Caucasian or a Russian or an Italian. You may or may not see it. And the other thing is, is when people are talking about the breed characteristics, I find that they give all different descriptions. So I threw some in there, not because I believe in them, but because you should be aware that I get the feeling a lot of this is anecdotal and we're not, you're not always getting a research verified characteristic. This I put in because it was interesting. It talked about where, where the different breeds had originally come from. And it seems to me like, depending on where I'm reading, they all say that they're likely to swarm or not likely to swarm. They all say that they are uh, low robbing or heavy robbing. They all say, it just seems like every time I read this, you as a beekeeper, hopefully have already figured out, you get to know your hive. And every time the queen changes, a few weeks later, you should expect to see your bees start to change. Africanized was seemed like a great idea when they introduced those African queens on purpose down in Brazil. They failed to realize why the Africanized the African bees were more disease tolerant. Um, why they didn't they didn't seem to succumb to varroa mites, for example, or other diseases. Well, first of all, it's because they swarm to disinfect basically, and they can they can produce brood really fast because that's what they do. They take off and they don't just swarm to to reproduce. They also abscond swarm where they take off because there is a shortage in Africa. There's going to be droughts. There's going to be good seasons and bad seasons. So in the middle of the year, in the middle of what we would think of as the beekeeping season and would not think of as a swarm time, over there in Africa, they were in the habit of running out of food and they had to have a way to deal with this. So they would just stop raising brood and take off. So the pros and the cons kind of all fit into each other and how they got into the Africanized mess. Saskatras. I'm hearing a lot about that, so I put a little bit about that. I don't know. It depends on how reliable your breeder is as to whether you'll actually get these traits or if you'll get mutts that have maybe part of this, maybe none of it. So I keep saying that you have no control over that queen mating. 10 to 20 drones is an estimate. They actually, in research, have verified that some queens are uh, very, very social and end up mating with 30, 40, 50 drones. That's not unknown at all. And that is half of the genetics that you didn't pick unless you're on an island geographically isolated or artificial insemination, which is why it's become such a big topic in trying to improve honeybee lines. And you can disagree with it, I think I feel a little queasy in my stomach about messing with nature that much. But you can see why. You can see the reasoning behind it. And it's even more important that you know what drones your queens are mating with when you realize that every important trait is multigeneic. It's not a single gene that gives temperament. It's not a single gene that gives the ability to a hive to lay up more surplus stores than another hive. It's not a single gene that's going to give them the ability to do something about varroa mites, grooming behaviors, removal of diseased brood behaviors, what we call varroa sensitive hygiene. All important traits are actually a combination of genes. 
And that means you got to get those in the same B. And if you if you don't have control over those drones, you don't have control over those genetics. And there's a couple of ways to do it. We can talk about drone saturation and such too. There's there's techniques where they try to control it. Uh, commercial breeders, rather than do commercial, do artificial insemination. Drone saturation, isolation, there's some methods you can use. And that homologous recombination, the wild card genetics, it's one of the highest known in animal genetics. What you learned in high school biology about the dominant negative, remember the brown eyes, blue eyes, and like that. Um, genes that seem to go together, like skin and hair color kind of go together. Uh, it's rare to have a dark-eyed blonde or, or blue-eyed black-haired. Well, that does happen. Actually, that does happen, I think, more often. I've actually seen that more often than a dark-eyed blonde. It can happen, but generally, sets of genes are linked. And epigenetics, like in high, livestock genetics, don't work. It's not that easy. It is important that you understand that sex, queen worker, female, or drone, male, is determined by the number of chromosomes. So sexual determination is by whether there are two sets of chromosomes in that B or one set. Two sets female, one set male. Any female egg can become a queen if properly fit. Males stay males. So when you combine all these characteristics together, how can you breed for a polygenic multi-gene trait such as mite resistance, which is not a single gene at all. There's several different behaviors and each of those behaviors requires a set of genes to result in that ability to resist mites. And there's a picture of homologous recombination in case you, it vaguely sounds familiar from like high school biology or something where chromosomes don't stay distinct. They cross over. Here's a visual on that. One set, two sets, male, female. Just if you need to kind of see it, how much difference it makes. And then food makes a difference between worker and queen. If you want to kind of get into the nerdy part of this and really get into the genetics, there is a website, davecushman.net. It is now maintained by Roger. Uh, Roger, I want to say Patterson. I think so. And he, Dave Cushman has long since been dead, but he did such wonderful diagrams to help people understand things like if you had different genes. So I threw this into your handout just because I wanted you to know there is such a website out there. If you st sort of start saying, wait, wait, okay, if she mates with 10 or 20 drones, how many different types of offspring does she have? And if I multiply out the number of chromosomes, just the number of chromosomes, how many chromosome pair combinations would I end up with in the worker bees? It, I don't know, I find it fascinating, but it's okay if you don't. Multigenetic, again, in all this genetics, you're looking for, most beekeepers are looking for honey production. A lot of them want the early brood production. Others say it's okay if they take a while to get their population up, like the carnelons. Temperament, we all need a, a, at least a manageable temperament. European fowl brood resistance, that was another reason that the Italians became so popular in the United States and why they were imported very early on in the United States before the 1922 quarantine, the shutdown of adult bees coming in and out of the United, well, into the United States, probably could go out. European fowl brood was something that, again, the Italians had seen, and the Italian honeybees carried that. Tracheal mite resistance was another thing they carried. Hygienic behavior, we're hoping for that from like the Russians and, and the breeding programs that have been done. And hygienic behavior often means removal of diseased brood. There's several other ways that 
bees can fight the varroa mites. But that one is a fairly simple one to test. Okay, maybe you're not into to getting into this complicated genetics, but how about locally adapted survivor stock? And I consider this mostly a sales promotion because of the crazy genetics. And because we keep bringing up so many Italifornians that even if you got started out with a fairly pure Russian queen and hive, that her offspring queens, when you go to make splits or she gets superseded, is those queens are going to have to open, they're going to be open mating with the bees you didn't select, you didn't pay for. Now, there are some people who've really, really worked on breeding programs. Olympic Wilderness Apiaries way over on the Olympic Peninsula really takes it seriously. Mark Adams, northwestqueens.com, but I don't know if he's selling. And I should have put in Lori, L-A-U-R-I, starts with M, Miller. Yes, Miller Compound Bees. And, um, and she takes it very seriously too, her breeding. But I do think that buying local is good, not for locally adapted and genetics, but because the bees haven't been transported. They're less stressed, including the queen, which means her laying ability may be better and she may maintain that laying ability for more seasons because she wasn't chilled or heated or stressed otherwise. The other thing about buying local is you're not bringing more disease in. Right now, people are worried about small hive beetle coming in, but also, also um, if you're bringing in mites every year with all the nukes and packages coming in, and if all those mites and nukes have been Mites in the nukes have been exposed to all the commercial pesticide use, which is pretty high. Then you may be getting a shipment of mites with your bees that are more resistant to some of the methods that are easiest to use. For example, apivar. Apivar is starting to fail in a number of places. I've, I've heard it enough places. I, anecdotally, I think it's true. A lot of beekeepers are starting to say it. I don't know if anyone's researching it yet. Apivar is one of those strips you can put in and leave for 40 some to 50 some days inside of a hive. And you can do it at fairly low temperatures if the bees are moving around. Getting back to anatomy, why is this important? Again, knowing about queen anatomy is really important. Her exposure to pesticides, her exposure to shipping stress, her exposure to whatever you're putting in there for varroa sides and stuff into your hives to control varroa. She's living the longest. In a lot of ways, she's getting the most effect. She's the egg layer up to a thousand per day. What if something, one of these stresses, chemical or temperature or whatever, affects her queen signal? Queen signal being an old-fashioned term for a lot of different chemicals that she exudes through a lot of glands in her body. By now, you may already know that queen pheromone is not really so much airborne as tactile, as contact-borne. And that's why that retinue keeps forming around the queen. The workers are coming over and they're, yes, they're taking care of her. And they're cleaning her and feeding her and probably massaging her and anything else she wants. But they're also picking up her pheromones and they are taking them and spreading them throughout the hive. She alone, though, can spread an incredible number of pheromones. And as you are going in your hive, you've been watching her patrol that brood nest. And good queens are always on checking what are the workers. Have they cleaned up that brood cell yet so she can lay in it? And they're, they're constantly on the move patrolling, they, they stop for breaks in the retinue forms, but a lot of the time they're patrolling. Look at her tarsal glands in that lower left picture. She is spreading pheromones all around. Now, worker bees also spread the pheromones. We tend to call them trail pheromones when the worker bees are spreading them on like flowers that they're foraging on. But look at all the different glands she's got in her body. 
she is producing from the mandibular. We often talk about the uh, QMP, queen mandibular pheromone. But she's spreading through the tarsal glands while she walks around. We know that she that the dufour gland and the tergite glands have people disagree on exactly what they do, but look at all the effects that the total of her queen signals gives. Look at all those behave that in the other diagram, all the pluses and minuses, what is enhanced or encouraged and what is repressed or discouraged by her presence. She affects a lot of behaviors. It's not, Monarch, monarchial orders, she is always constantly there affecting it. And that's why the loss of a queen, you know right away when you open the hive, you can hear the difference, they look different, they act different, you know, because suddenly that positive, negative enhancement suppression isn't there and they don't have the same focus that they had before. Your queen does have to mate with about seven drones for the colony to survive. Usually that's not difficult. However, in Western Washington, how much mating weather have you seen? For people who can make splits all over the United States, could we realistically do that? In Western Washington at this time? I, not in my area. I think in some of the lowland areas, it might have been possible for a queen to have mated, but the other hives have to provide those drones. And she has to mate well. Last year with these cold, wet springs, this year and last year, last year, for the first time ever, I saw, I had my own drone laying queen, verified two other people's drone laying queens, and talked on the phone with the fourth person. Before that, I had seen one drone layer ever. The, they... Queens could not get successfully mated. I don't think it was genetics. I think it was just lack of opportunity. It kept raining at the wrong time. And she can't just mate any time. It has to be in about that six to 10 days post-emergence after her development. And when she does that, she stores the sperm during that single mating period. Could be a couple flights over a couple days, but that's it for life. When she flies again in a swarm, she doesn't mate again. And I already talked about the inbreeding. It's discouraged in all kinds of ways in nature. So even if you have drones in your hive, she's got to fly up at her altitude, her distance, go out and find the drones. But let the drones find her, actually. And that is one of the times when her pheromone that she emits through the air that one is important, is in the mating flight. Drone congregation areas, DCAs. It is possible for a queen to mate with siblings. It's not impossible. It's just nature works against it. But if she's on her flyway, maybe rising up to get to her altitude, and a drone is there and can take advantage of the situation, maybe she could mate with too closely related a drone that way. Once she gets to a, a drone congregation area and she's being chased by a comet of drones, she can mate every two seconds. The drone mates once and dies. The next drone moves up, removes the mating sign, which is the polite word for the poor drone before left his uh, mating appendage in there when he successfully made it and dropped off and died. But the next drone knocks that out of the way and then mates again. And she can do this in one flight. She can get her, I don't know, she can do the full 20 in one flight if she's doing 10 to 20. But it is possible every two seconds. They're lined up and they do it. Now, mating is getting, is not just problematic in this area. There's a high rate of queens being superseded in the first year. And we don't, know exactly why. Dave Tarpey and quite a number of researchers are actually looking into this. This there is research on. When they were doing research projects, they had trouble getting queens to finish an entire season. They would have queen, so many queen replacements. And that, of course, as you know, if the queen changes, the character of the hive changes. Everything changed. 
in, in could change, or maybe you don't notice a big change at all. That happens too. You just look and your marked queen isn't there and late in the season, it's a, it's another queen. She's not marked. She's not the same color. And it's always a good idea to take a, color, a picture of your queen as soon as you spot her in the hive, because later on in the year, you're looking and you're going, was she really that dark? Did she have stripes? And that's, it's nice to know that it was, that you now have a young queen, check her brood pattern. Maybe you lucked out and everything's great. But it is sort of important because of this high rate of queens being superseded to recognize it and do something, have a plan, have an understanding about, about how this, how you're going to deal with this. And again, in your handouts, I believe I put some, some timelines. If you were to let bees, the worker bees, totally start over raising a queen from the egg and they raise her out, the problem is there's no replacement workers being raised during that time until she finally lays and then it's another 21 days. And so the total can be 51 days from your queen disappeared. We, we beginning beekeepers get it blamed on them a lot that they rolled the queen. It could be something else totally different. It could be she's one of those that gets superseded. And for some reason, something, some slight defect that you can't see, but the workers are aware of. If they supersede her, they start the egg as a queen. It's 52 days till you get that emerging offspring. And it's another 21 days before that's a foraging bee, approximately. This gets important when you're making decisions and, and when you're trying to explain it to someone else. Hey, it might be worth going and springing $45 or whatever for that for a new queen and smashing this supersedure cell, checking to make sure there's no queen in the hive and starting with a mated queen because you're going to save a lot of time in there. Um, You'd be saving almost 30 days, 26 days. I, I think I figured, oh, here I put it. I wrote it down. 25 days about with a mated queen. And if you've got a queen who's laying well, there are very few people who will sell you a queen on a frame of her own brood, a queen that has not been caged. Her pheromones have not been diminished. She has not been shipped and she hasn't been um, stressed that way and if you do that introduce a queen on a frame of her of her own brood into a hive wow you've saved a lot of time if you were hoping for honey harvest or you're hoping to make splits or whatever else from that hive that year anytime you get a replacement mated queen and you weren't guaranteed otherwise she was probably banked and banked is can be done improperly very easily Sometimes people haven't considered how to do it the best way. Even when you put the queen in the cell into the cages, her ovaries, now this is, I've, heard, I've read some places this isn't true, but something happens and you do have to wait and give her time to lay sometimes. What stress is it? It's usually been described as her ovaries start shrinking, her pheromones start decreasing, and she has to get back up to the laying level she was at before she was put in that cage. And other people say, no, nah, no, nah, it's not that. Part of this is that deciding is it worth buying a queen. When is the queen laying the eggs that will forge the blackberry flow? How many days before the blackberry bloom do you need to have that queen there laying eggs? And I would say it's the 21 days it takes for egg to emerge as adult plus about 21 days for that adult to turn into a forager. So about 42 days, and we have a short season. So some of these queen decisions will be critical depending on whether you care. If you're keeping bees to keep bees, it may not be as important, but it is a decision. And um, Rusty Burlew, who's not from Montana, actually she went back to Colorado, I think, but she lived for a long time near the Rochester area of, of Western Washington. She discusses this. Honeybeesweet.com is one of the top sources for good articles on topics you care about. 
and it's a well-maintained website. One of the best blog websites I have seen. It is the best I've seen for honeybees. And you just go to the search bar, type in something like replacement queen, uh, supersedure rate, queen development, something like that. And Forge, she has just published a couple of articles recently. It's a website well worth checking out. So that's the queen, and that's the one that we worry about the most, but it's also equally important. Everything you're going to read about workers, it isn't just facts and figures on a, on a piece of paper. It makes a difference that one of the biggest reasons to study the succession of duties that adult worker bees go through after emergence is the critical one, day 12 to 17 on this chart, hive builder produces wax and constructs comb ripens honey. I have known so many beekeepers to try to feed their bees one-to-one -one later in the year, and they try to get the bees to draw out wax. And they're puzzled on why the bees don't know to draw out wax so that they can store plenty of stores for the winter. When you are a beginner, we push feed, feed, feed early in the spring, you need that wax comb drawn out. But sometimes beekeepers think, well, I got one deep, that's enough. And maybe a, a little bit of a part of a super or something, that's enough. And then we tell you that we want you to overwinter in two deeps your first winter or two. You could do it in less, but it's easier. You have better success if you have two deeps full of wax, bees, and stores. But you can't get that wax drawn out late in the year as easily because late in the year, your bees are dropping in population. They're not raising as much fruit. If fewer eggs are raised to larvae, are raised to emerging young adult bees, fewer bees are going to hit that 12 to 17 day peak period at which they are going to draw out wax. So you really need that wax early in the year, this time of the year. And there's a lot of reasons that you need to be feeding, and that is one of them, is to get that wax comb drawn out. And then the forager age is critical too. It's the most dangerous, dangerous time of a worker bee's life, and that's why it comes at the end. That's when the predators can get her, when her GPS can fail, when being parasitized by varroa mites as a larva mm -hmm. or a young adult can finally wear her out so she cannot do. She can't complete the foraging. Mite, varroa mite parasitism can actually show up in a lot of places, but this is one of them. You just can't get any honey production out of your hives if you don't treat at the right times for mites successfully. Let me see where I am because I'm just about where I should stop. I don't have that many. Yeah, I only have a few slides, but it's just a few too many to finish. So let's stop there. We'll just pick up with worker phases, the concept of this progressive duties that they do right on this slide. Okay. And thank you so much for listening to all this. You are a wonderful audience. Um, but now, now you get to actually ask questions, okay?